Hey, it's Ed. Before we start, I've got two brand new Patreon supporters I want to thank. Mia Trams and David Ward. Both Mia and David went to mountainandprairie.com slash support and signed up to support the podcast on a monthly basis, which I greatly appreciate. You may or may not know, but there's a bunch of exclusive content for the folks who decide to support via Patreon. There's some video chats of me with past podcast guests that I'm sure you'd recognize. I also send out a monthly email newsletter through Patreon with a bunch of different recommendations, some related to the West, some not. A lot of books, a lot of articles, films, podcasts, that kind of thing. Some of it's actually pretty weird, but people seem to enjoy it, and uh, so I'm glad I can share some of my weirdness with fellow weirdos. But anyway, to everybody who supported the podcast over the years, whether monthly or one time, thank you all very, very much. Hey, this is Ed Robertson, and this is the Mountain and Prairie Podcast, where I introduce you to some of the innovative individuals who are shaping the future of the American West. I meet most of these people through my work in land conservation or through my hobbies and interests that revolve around spending time up high in the mountains. My guests include ranchers, writers, entrepreneurs, conservationists, athletes, artists, adventurers, pretty much anyone who's doing important work, has an interesting story, and loves the American West. My guest today is John Branch. John is a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist with the New York Times and the author of the brand new book, Side Country, Tales of Death and Life from the Back Roads of Sports. He's also the author of The Last Cowboys, A Pioneer Family in the New West, which is one of my favorite books about the modern-day challenges facing ranching families in the American West. Whether he's reporting on the historic ascent of the Dawn Wall on Yosemite's El Capitan, reconstructing a deadly avalanche in the Washington backcountry, or describing the financial realities of the cattle ranching business, John has one of the most unique and engaging voices you'll find anywhere in print. Growing up in Colorado, John never had serious childhood dreams about a career in writing or journalism. He studied business at CU Boulder and graduated fully focused on pursuing jobs in the business world. But after several years of building a successful career with retail-focused companies, John found himself dreaming of a career as a writer. So, in the mid-1990s, with very little writing experience under his belt, he applied to graduate school, was accepted, and officially began his journey as a journalist. Fast forward to 2013, and John won the Pulitzer Prize for his New York Times article titled Snowfall, The Avalanche at Tunnel Creek. In our modern-day frenetic world that's overflowing with articles and information, I found that John's work rises above the fray and sticks with me for many years after my first reading. While he's reported on many well-known sports figures such as Tommy Caldwell or even Kobe Bryant, John says he enjoys finding meaning in the less flashy tales, telling the stories of, quote, ordinary people tangled up in something extraordinary. So in this conversation, we talk about his commitment to uncovering these little-known stories, from his on-the-ground reporting to his process of sitting down at the keyboard to write. We also dig into some of his favorite outdoor-related stories, his new book, Side Country, and his older book, The Last Cowboys, and his unconventional path into journalism. We talk about reporting from the top of El Cap, his process of writing Snowfall, his heroes and mentors, and much more. And finally, John offers up some great book and music recommendations, as well as timely advice for aspiring creatives. I've been a huge fan of John's for many years, so I can't thank him enough for taking the time to chat with me. I encourage you to find copies of Side Country and The Last Cowboys, and keep an eye out for everything that he writes for the New York Times. Check out the notes for links to everything we discuss. Hope you enjoy. I was looking at your Twitter uh, this morning, actually, and I saw a tweet that you put out yesterday on June 1st, and we're recording this on June 2nd, and you said, I graduated high school on June 1st. If you told me that on some future June 1st, I would have a book full of my favorite New York Times stories published, I would say, quote, shut up, dude, and pass me another Zima. <laughs> so, so tell me about that guy, 17, 18 years old, graduating oh from uh, from high school. I mean, what, other than like in Zima, which I think we all went through a phase of that if you're over 40, <laughs> what, what's the, uh, what was he like? 
Yeah, it's funny. I that, that was kind of a a, um, a little wisecrack. My dad worked for Coors. I grew up in Golden, Colorado, uh-huh. and Zima was a Coors product. You know, very eighties. Oh yeah. So we, you know, we always had beer at our house, and my my friends all had beers at their house. We did not really go through much of a Zima phase, so that was kind of like a joke. Because I think Zima's more, you know, it's funnier than pass me a Coors Light. Sure. Um, <laughs> But everybody went through a Zima phase. So certain people of a certain age would get that joke. And I thought people maybe your age and oh, younger yeah. would be like, what is he talking about? Oh, no, Zima. I was right on the edge of Zima. It was yeah. it was a kind of retro when I was coming through. <laughs> it, was, it was probably before its time because now they're doing those white claws. And that's basically a Zima. Zima. Yeah. Zima. Uh, yeah. Uh, repackaged. Uh, what was I like? I was not um, I had no idea I would become a journalist. Mm. I um, at 17 or 18 when I graduated high school. I was just kind of a nerdy dude, not much different than I am now. Um, Same hair, basically, that I have now. And I went to the University of Colorado in Boulder, and I was a business major. And so it was the 80s, and I thought, well, the smart thing to do would be to go get a business degree and go try to get a job with IBM or whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, It was very much the Ronald Reagan kind of 80s, go do the proper business-y thing sort of route. And so I did that. Yeah, I, I don't know that I've changed a lot, but I certainly had no clue what life was going to bring me. I mean, I couldn't have mapped this out. In the back, in the very back recesses of my head, I mm-hmm. loved the idea of journalism. I was one of those guys that grew up as a huge sports fan. Yeah. And, you know, this is all sort of pre ESPN or the cusp of, of ESPN. And I would get up in the mornings to grab the, the Denver Post or the Rocky Mountain News and go through the box scores to see how the teams that I was following did. I could memorize, I had, you know, uh, rosters from baseball and football basically memorized. Nice. And um, so a lot of my friends said, you ought to be a sportscaster someday. And I'm like, you've seen my face, right? I'm not going to be a sportscaster. And so I went off and went to business school. And so it was really about 10 years later that I kind of listened to that little tickle in the back of my brain going, you know, journalism, if that's what your passion is, maybe you should really think about this. And so... So what, so what was the moment? Yeah, I changed careers. Yeah. So, so did you, you graduate from college and went into the business world for a while? I did. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is thrilling. I know, but I went. No, into, I did the same um, thing, man. I got an MBA yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So I, I've been exactly. down again. We've got parallel lives. So I, I'm definitely interested. Yeah. I want to how did so graduated college business yeah, degree. So I graduated then what? college. I went to um, into the executive training program at May DNF, which is a May Company department store, mm-hmm. and I was an assistant buyer for a while um, on track to become a buyer. And in that era, it was like the Friends era. Rachel Green was a buyer for Macy's, I think, or Bloomingdale's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was basically Rachel Green. Um, <laughs> and so I did that for a couple of years. And then they, as part of the training program, they put you out into the stores. And so in Denver, at the brand new Cherry Creek Made Enough, which became a, a Foley's, I guess, afterward. And I'm mm-hmm. not even sure what's there now. Um, I was the department manager for uh, Crystal and uh, Housewares. Wow. And so all the wedding registry people and all the people buying towels or not towels, um, all, all the people buying coffee makers and things like that. And I did that for a while. And I was like, I don't love this. I don't really love wearing a suit every day and doing this. And at that time, Price Club, which is now Costco, mm-hmm. um, came to Denver and opened three warehouses. And I had a friend who, two friends who left many enough and went to go work for a Price Club. And they're like, John, you would love this. It's like casual and fun. It's warehousey. It's vibrant. You know, you're not talking about crystal to all these old ladies. You're actually like working in this kind of fun environment. And so I went and worked for Costco for six years. Wow. I was a uh, manager at Costco and um, things were going great. And after about six years, I was probably 28 or so, 29. And I kind of said, this is not exactly what I wanted to be doing. Like, I love it. I still love Costco. I still go to Costco. Um, but I felt like I'm about one or two years from being, feeling like I'm trapped here because Mm -hmm. I'm starting to make some money. I've got to think a pretty good future here. And so I said, let's, let's do midlife crisis now. And so I did my midlife crisis at age 29. I went back to school in Boulder to get a master's in journalism and on a flyer, I had never written anything really. I'd never worked for a paper, never published anything, never, uh, worked for a student newspaper, anything like that. So thought because I was sort of in love with the idea of journalism and read enough that I thought I could probably pull this off. I was young and dumb. Um, and somehow it's worked out. So what did your folks think about that? I mean, it sounds like your dad had a, had a good career, but you know, in the, in the business world and, and were they, were they surprised by, by that? Cause I think about it very similar. I mean, kind of similar of I was in North Carolina kind of doing what I thought I was supposed to do. And it was 
fine. It wasn't, it wasn't miserable or anything. I was doing pretty well, but I always had this urge. I wanted to move out West. And so when I was 27, I just kind of found an opportunity, picked up and moved. And thankfully my parents were kind of confused, but very supportive. <laughs> and so yeah. how, how did yours handle it? Yeah, it's funny. You and I do have parallel lives. Yeah. I don't really remember telling I I take that back. I can, I remember being in the kitchen telling my parents and being nervous about it. Like, and I was married and we didn't have kids at the time. And I'm like, I just want to do this. And they're kind of like, okay. I remember telling my mother-in-law, I remember where I was when I told her and I'm sure she, I, she handled it probably as well as he could, but I'm sure in her mind, she probably went home and, you know, talked to her husband, like, what are they doing? <laughs> well, who is our daughter married? <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it took a lot of years before I made as much money in journalism as I did when I left Costco for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So a few years of journalism school. And then is that when you, what, you right out of, after that, you moved to Colorado Springs where I am? To, yeah. To work? So as it worked out, I was, I was in grad school in Boulder, living in Littleton, mm -hmm. working at Costco. Um, and Costco, when I quit, they said, we're sad about this. Um, but do you want to hang out while you're in school and work as a supervisor or something? And so I was a supervisor during my college and Costco paid my way through journalism school. And in Boulder, they had an internship down in Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. So people in Colorado, now that's kind of a long ways away. And I was in Littleton and they said, would you be willing to drive down to Colorado Springs for the summer internship? And I said, sure. So every day that summer I drove down there and I was down there a couple of weeks before the business editor there. I was a business intern because that was mm -hmm. my background said, what are you doing when you graduate in December? And I said, I don't know. And he goes, I'll give you a job right now. And I'm like, okay, deal. <laughs> so I worked uh, several years, probably five years at the Colorado Springs Gazette, first in business and then in, in the sports. And so when did you, so, so when you transitioned out of business and towards sports, you know, obviously, obviously that's worked out, worked out for you. Um, I mean, what was that like, like just getting in the midst of it? Cause I think, I feel like now when I read your stuff, you've got such a unique voice and you focus on such unique aspects of sports stories that it, I just, I don't see it other places. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not like a massive sports fan, but I read a lot and, and your voice is just so unique, but I would imagine, you know, to use a sports analogy, it's like when you're first learning to play basketball, you just got to learn to dribble and that no, no fancy tricks here, just dribble. And so what were those first few years of being at the bottom of the, of the rung of the ladder in the journalism world. I mean, is it, can you describe that? Well, I mean, I will say I, I never saw it as like the bottom of the rung. I yeah. mean, I was really lucky that I got to the Gazette because I was a good sized newspaper. Sure. A lot of people I was going to school with were going to small towns. I joked with my wife when I was in grad school, I said, you realize what we're doing here. I'm going to probably have to move to Iowa to go cover high school sports. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so somehow we ended up being able to stay in Colorado at a, a paper that I had probably no business being at, you know, size wise and prestige wise. So I got very lucky. The first of the, about a zillion lucky steps I've taken and, and had handed to me. And so the first few years were interesting. They, I think I always had a sense of let's do things a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. And part of that was because pretty quickly they moved me up to Denver to cover the Denver sports scene. Nice. And as the, like the third paper in Colorado, when you're covering these teams that have, you know, armies of reporters covering them, I realized pretty quickly, I'm not going to keep up with all the breaking news mm -hmm. of, you know, trades and coaching changes and so on. I'm I just probably not. And so how can I set myself apart and how can our readers, what can our readers get that they're not going to get anywhere else? Mm -hmm. um, I don't want the Gazette just to be an echo of what happened in the Denver Post the day before. Sure. And so my whole mantra became, let's find stories that nobody else is doing. Mm -hmm. And literally here I am 20 years later doing the exact same thing for the New York Times, just trying to find stories that nobody else is doing if I can do it. Yeah. And I want to talk a lot that about me that. A lot. that. That's, that's great. Um, and I definitely want to dig into that a little bit more, but point, so you were in Colorado Springs, if Wikipedia is correct, which it very well may not be. And then you were in Fresno and then New York times. So what, when did the New York times take notice? Like, how does that, how did that work? Cause that just seems like it's probably a, a, a crazy dream when you, you heard from them. Yeah. Um, it was a crazy dream and I have good friends to, to thank for it. So when I was in Colorado Springs, the sports editor was a guy named Jeff Grant and his wife was a columnist for a few years while I was in Denver covering Denver sports, uh, Lynn Zinzer. And then I went to Fresno. They moved to New York for other jobs. And she called me one day and said, and I was I, at that time in Fresno, I was interviewing for columnist jobs around the West. Mm -hmm. And so I thought my next step would just be a columnist at a bigger paper than Fresno. 
And she called me one day and said, hey, John, there's a there's an opening at the New York Times. She was then by then working at the New York Times covering the Giants football team. Yep. Um, thought, you know, you might be interested. And I'm like, hey, thanks, Lynn. I appreciate I appreciate this. I appreciate you thinking of me, but I'm a columnist here. I'm I think I'm going to get this job, you know, in this other big city here on the West Coast. I don't want to write be a beat writer again in New York. That's a fish out of water. Come on. <laughs> And so I hung up and my wife, thankfully, was standing there and she's like, did you just tell the New York Times that you're not interested in applying to the New York Times? <laughs> and I said, uh, is that how that came across? Yeah, I called in again. I'm like, all right, tell them I'll send my stuff. Thank you very much. That was nice of you to think of me. I'll send my stuff. And I remember I got a call a few days later saying, do you want to come here and interview? So Lynn Zinser um, got my foot in the door there. I'm not sure they were w- would have noticed me otherwise. So. Thinking about, you know, changing careers, going to journalism school, you know, jumping in the journalism game and and making it to the New York Times. I mean, you've mentioned, you know, you've got this network of people that have been helpful to you. You mentioned luck. You obviously work extremely hard. I mean, if you had to boil it down to what, you know, what worked for you, why you've been so successful being able to go from a business career and no journalism experience to, you know, the, the one of the top people, the New York times is crazy. I mean, what is the, what is the formula? I mean, like, what would you say? Why has that worked? I, I honestly do think it takes a lot of serendipity mm-hmm. and I'll give you an example. When I was at the Colorado Springs Gazette as a business reporter, um, this is a horrible story, but I was there as a business reporter for two years. And again, kind of like Costco, I was comfortable in it. It was Monday through Friday. I was thought I was pretty good at it, thought I had a, a future doing it. Sports was sort of in the back of my mind because that was my kind of love. But I wasn't you know, you know, married to the idea of being a sports writer. And then one day, one of our reporters, sports reporters, had a brain aneurysm mm. and died. And they called me in the office on that Monday morning and said, we hear you wanted to be a sports reporter. We could use you now. If he doesn't die, who knows what happens? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just weird serendipity that sort of got me there. If Lynn Zinzer does not get the job in New York, do I ever go to the New York Times? Um, I think if there's any lesson, it's that I was willing to walk through some of the doors that opened. You know, I'm a big believer, and I do this when I travel. You know, walk down sidewalks, look around corners, and I think you know there's a metaphor there for being willing to explore a little bit. And when a door opens, at least poke your head inside and take a look inside. And, um, I've been fortunate that I've done that with my career. No, I think that's great advice. No matter, no matter what you're doing. So I want to jump right into your, <clears throat> your new book, Side Country, cause I, I loved it. And I was, I was very, yeah, I was familiar with, obviously very familiar with your work. And I had, um, I, I bet I'd read maybe a third of the, of the, the chapters, you know, when they were in, in the New York times, but there were so many in there that are just so great. But one of the big surprises to me that I just I absolutely loved was the introduction to the book because I had – sometimes I kind of skim through the introduction pretty quickly. But I felt like it was very revealing as to how you approach your work, and I thought you were – made yourself pretty vulnerable about some of the, how you get still get nervous these days and how you look back on your old work and worry you're not, you may not be uh, as good of a writer as you used to be. And so I, I love seeing that from somebody who's at the top of their field, that there's still that humility and, and kind of worry. I don't know if it just makes me feel better about myself, but, uh, <laughs> but could you just talk a little bit about how, I think one of the quotes was you say that, you love to to find stories of ordinary people tangled in something extraordinary. And so can you just talk about that? Because most of these book, most of the stories in there are not about famous people. They're, they're it's very right. obscure. So can you I'm sorry I'm blabbing, but can you just talk about that, how you go about doing that? Yeah. I mean I've certainly spent a lot of time writing about famous people. So maybe a different book will be about the stories I've written about famous people. Yeah. But the ones that tend to mean the most to me are the ones that I feel a deeper connection to the people because maybe I'm the only one that's ever written about them. And I feel like I'm bringing the world a story that otherwise would not be told. You know, if I'm, if I'm writing about Tiger Woods, somebody else is going to write a story about Tiger Woods. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to miss it if I don't write it. Um, But I do like the idea that I'm writing stories that are illuminating people and circumstances that maybe don't get illuminated otherwise. And this book is full of them. Yeah, there, there are probably not many names that readers will know before they go in this. And, and part of that, too, is kind of a dare. I think I mentioned this in the introduction that, yeah, it's a different kind of journalism where 
it's kind of a dare. Like, can I write a story about somebody you've never heard of about a subject you know nothing about and get you to read it and engage with it and then pass it on and remember it and treasure it or whatever? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, but I'm, I'm really proud that these 20 some stories are all sort of of that ilk. And I hope that people will find something in there. You know, at least some of the stories will resonate with them in, in unexpected ways. It's, it's really in my mind, the trick is to try to surprise people and um, get them to read something or at least start to read something that they go, why would I be reading this? And then go, Oh my gosh, when they get to the end, I'm glad I read that. Yeah. I stumbled across it. Well, and I think even, you know, towards the end of the book, you, you, there's this story you wrote about the Kobe Bryant plane crash. And I mean, how many stories were written about the Kobe Bryant plane crash, but yours was taken from a completely different angle from uh, a church full of people who were there and, and saw it happen and kind of, you get all the important information about the event, but it's in this completely different uh, format that, you know, is so memorable to me. I remember I read that when it came out, like the, the day it came out and I still think about that specifically. And, and I can't, I don't, and that was a, that was a very big day and a tragic day and kind of burned into my brain for a lot of reasons. Yeah. And and your story is kind of the one that I always think about. So, I mean, I'm sure, you know, you're in this world, you're, you're getting these stories, their the ideas coming to you all the time. I mean, how do you know when there's a story there worth writing? Because as we were talking a little bit about before we started recording, if you dig, dig deep enough, even in the most boring person, you can find interesting stuff. So is there a, a system or is it just a gut feeling or whatever that, that when you know, all right, this is, this is worth digging into and writing about? It's mostly a gut feeling. Mm -hmm. um, part of it's selfish. Uh, I write mostly stories on subjects and people I don't know a lot about. Mm -hmm. um, and that keeps me engaged and it really puts me on my toes because I know the readers are smarter than I am on some of these subjects. Yeah. And so can I, can I do enough reporting and write this well enough and smartly enough that people who know the subject better than I do will say, yeah, he, he, did, he nailed it. It was mm -hmm. fair and accurate and, and, and the right tone and all that. Um, and so I try to sort of live in that world of, of other people that I find interesting. And so it's, it's kind of selfish. Like I want to know more about this. This intrigues me. If it intrigues me, would it not intrigue at least some section of the New York times readership? Mm -hmm. I would hope so. And so in some ways I kind of see this as a very selfish endeavor and, and I'm just happy when I write something that I think this was a cool experience for me that then resonates with some, some number of, of our readership. And, and that's the, that's the thing that's the best part of my job is that I get to, I get to explore worlds um, and I have a great time doing it. Nobody's got a better job than I do. Yeah. I get to call people up who answer the phone because it's John Branch from the New York Times. Yeah, I'll talk to the New York Times. Nobody's ever called me from the New York Times before. And I get to go where other people and most of our readers would love to go and mm -hmm. have access to people maybe that they wouldn't have access to or places they wouldn't have access to. And I feel like that's a huge responsibility and I want to do it right. And it's a ton of fun for me. And if the readers um, get something out of it, then that's all great. I mean, it's, it's a win-win for all of us, I hope. Well, I, I imagine, you know, being able to say you're with the New York Times opens the door, but when you get there to meet the people, I mean, you got to form a connection with these people and, and allow them to open up. And I, I loved your book, The Last Cowboys. Um, I read it several years ago. And before I started doing conservation, I was in the ranch brokerage world. So I operated a lot with these ranchers all over the West who were, had very similar lifestyles to the Wright family that you write about. But one of the things, you know, when they hear this Southern accent of mine and I drive up in a Toyota truck, they're automatically suspicious. And it took a lot for me to figure out how to build trust with that community. And so I feel like in, in all of your articles and then, you know, and in, in, in that book specifically, that's quite a feat to be able to build rapport and trust with somebody who either doesn't know you at best or at worst is suspicious of the New York Times. Um, yeah. how, so how do you do that? It is a little bit of a trick because if I call somebody or email them and say, I'm from the New York Times, I know that there's some sort of perception in their head mm -hmm. of who I am and what I'm after. And the key, I think, for me is to try to get in front of them and and say, can I come meet you? Can I come talk to you? Can mm -hmm. we just discuss what I'm thinking? If I can get them to realize that I'm just a normal person, that I'm not 
whatever they might think of as a New York Times reporter, that I am a guy that grew up in a small town in Colorado and that I live in California, that I've written these kinds of stories before, that I'm not here to judge. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, my job is to be a listener and to convey people through the stories. I'm not here to judge people. I'm not here to try to get the readers to think of these people one way or the other. You know, a lot of the people I think we're talking about are people who sort of feel a little beleaguered because mm-hmm. popular culture has painted them a certain way. Maybe they're naive or maybe they're, and I'm thinking about like ranchers, maybe they're a certain political affiliation. And I'm like, we all know people are, are nuanced in a million different ways. Yeah. And I'm here, I'm here to find all the gray areas here. Mm-hmm. It's not black and white. And so I think the key is to get people to understand that I'm not here to judge. I'm not here to sensationalize. I just want to hear your story. And my reputation is on the line too. And so is the New York Times. And so it behooves me to to write as fairly and accurately as possible about the world that you inhabit. And usually they say, okay, let's talk. Yeah, it's it's worked out for me. But I, it's what I do all the time. You know, that these worlds, you know, in that book, there are 20 different stories on 20 different subjects. I think people, to your point before, people like to tell tell you about their worlds as long as they can trust the listener. Mm-hmm. And the key is to try to get them to trust the listener. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, I've read a lot of books about ranchers and about the ranching world, and I felt like Last Cowboys, it it was super entertaining and fun, you know. I mean, in a lot of ways, it is sports writing, but you go into public lands, you go into how real estate prices are being inflated, and it's you know, all the mm-hmm. issues that you could read 15, 20 books, you know, like from Wallace Stegner on <laughs> to try to get this understanding of the West, and I felt like your book – gave it all in a fun and entertaining and informative way. And so I, it helped me. I mean, even though I'm in that world, it it helped me a lot. So that was, I really enjoyed it. But back to side country, the, it started, the, the, the book starts out with your, your um, story snowfall about the, the big avalanche. How did that story catch your attention? Cause it went on to win a Pulitzer prize, which is just, can you believe that? I mean, (laughs) no, no, it's ridiculous. Um, (laughs) What's interesting about that is that it didn't really catch my eye at first. That happened in mm. February. It actually, there was another deadly avalanche in Washington the same day. Mm. And a stringer for us, I think based in Colorado, wrote a story about this has been a bad season for avalanches. And here are two more examples. And that story might have run on the front page that day, but I was not involved at all. And so about a month later, it was a sports editor, Joe Sexton, and he called me and said, do you remember that avalanche or that story about the avalanches? And I said, kind of. And he goes, you know, I think there's something more there. Why don't you, you know, pardon the pun, why don't you dig into that world a little bit? Mm-hmm. And so really the first thing I did was study what had been written about the avalanches that past season. And the deadliest one was the one at Stevens Pass in Washington. And it also was a rare one that had a lot of survivors. And so I thought, well, if I'm going to tell the story of avalanches more broadly, Let's start with this avalanche where people who are involved in it can can uh, be the witnesses to it. You know, a lot of avalanches kill the only witnesses, right? Mm-hmm. And so I started calling those people. And to your point before, that became a, a an exercise in trying to get them to trust me mm-hmm. because I was calling them six weeks after it. I was calling them from the New York Times. There were 16 people. We didn't know how many people were involved at the time, but there were 16 people involved, and they were all wondering, is it okay for me to talk to the New York Times? What's everybody else going to think? It was a really interesting story to start to report because there were a lot of human dynamics at play there and a lot of journalistic and reporting kind of dynamics at play there. But eventually, I got to one person, to the next person, the next person. I can imagine the phone tree between them was going on. Is it okay to talk to him? Are you guys cool if it, if, if I talk to this guy? Are mm-hmm. you guys cool if I talk to this guy? What did he ask you about? What do you, What's his mission? Are they trying to find blame? You know, yeah, They were yeah. worried that I was trying to blame somebody. Um, all those things were at play. And so that story you know, took several months of reporting um, and then writing. And then the New York Times... <laughs> did what the New York Times does better than anybody, and that is let's render this uh, visually. Mm -hmm. And we had a team of graphics people that wrapped my very, very long text in beautiful, uh, groundbreaking uh, animation and and graphics and photos. And um, the result was stunning. And you're right, the next year it won the Pulitzer Prize, which, you know, I totally expected. (laughs) (laughs) 
yeah, it, it's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, I, I'm very proud of that. I'm mostly proud of that because I feel like we did right as right as we could to the people mm -hmm. and to the people who were lost. And we also um, had a great collaboration at the New York Times. I'm very proud that it was a huge team effort. And, it's, and it still holds up as, as a text. I still get calls about it a lot. I know it's still taught at a lot of journalism schools, which is an honor. And I am told that it's still sometimes used in avalanche safety courses, which wow. tells me that we, that we um, did right by the, the educational side of it. Sure. Um, and science part of it. Well, I, I remember when it was published and to me, it's just amazing. Cause I, I feel like I'm in this state of information overload just constantly. It's just a, kind of a problem really. But the fact that I remember reading that on the computer and seeing those graphics that you mentioned and everything, you know, years, however, however many years later, I just think that's a testament because I, you know, I, I absorbed that kind of those kind of stories and there's no telling how many I've read about avalanches since then, but yours stands out. And so once again, I mean, I'm kind of being like a bit of a super fan here. So, <laughs> well, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm proud of that one. Um, and I'm proud that it holds up both as, I think, as a text, which, you know, in this book, it's obviously just a text. So I guess we'll see if people can can read 15,000 words about an avalanche without the graphics aiding them along. But I'm I'm super proud of the New York Times that they invested energy into it and saw worth in it and, and did it right. And that it holds up X number of years later that people still say that was a monumental moment in digital journalism. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm thrilled by that. So with a... A project like that, and I mean, I've got just kind of a, a larger question about how you go about structuring your articles, but maybe we could use this one as an example because it's so complex. You're talking to so many different people, you know, the landscape itself and the weather is almost like a character in the story. I mean, how do you even begin to go about structuring the article? I mean, I, I can kind of get my head around going out and talking to people and organizing the information. and But then when it comes time to write I mean, how do you do that? Do you write out an outline? Do you just start writing? How, do, how What's your process? So the short answer is this one was easier to write than um, I would like to admit. And here's why. As I was reporting that story, my interviews with everybody there, and I was trying to figure out how many people were there. Three people died, but nobody there knew how many others were there. Nobody there knew everybody else that was part of this party that kind of sort of through serendipity ga gathered that morning. Mm -hmm. And so I was chasing people that I didn't know, you know, when we didn't know exactly who was there. And so once I started to interview people, I really just interviewed them. Please walk me through that entire weekend. You know, how did you know that people were going? When did you get to Stevens Pass? Where'd you sleep the night before? What time did you get up? What'd you do that morning? Who'd you text? All those things. And so I did that for probably seven or eight of the people who were there. And then I moved from New York to California that summer. Mm. And in the middle of moving, I, I thought... My bosses have no idea how much work I've been doing on this. And so out of a sense of guilt, mostly, I took a giant Google file. I guess it was probably Google back then. And I had done a chron chronology, mm -hmm. minute by minute of that weekend, and cut and pasted everybody's quotes basically into it. You know, here's what they all said at 930, what we were doing. I was on a chair left here. I was having coffee here. I was in the car here at 945, you know, and did a chronology of that day through the people I'd interviewed so far just to wrap my own head around it. Mm -hmm. um, as you say, it was complex and I was gathering things like 911 calls and GoPro footage and anything else, text messages, anything else that would timestamp things. And because I felt guilty that I had not given my bosses a lot of stuff and I was now going to take a week or two weeks off to move across the, across the country, I dumped that file in their lap, which I've never done and I've never done since and said, here's where the reporting is, just so you know I've been working. Mm -hmm. And they saw it, and I think they went, holy crap, there's a lot of amazing material here. And that's when they turned around and passed it on to our graphics editors. Mm. who thought, and they, you know, said, hey, we're going to need some help with some graphics here, and certainly some photos. You know, here's what Branch is working on. And the graphics editor, Steve Duanis at the time, was like, oh, we've been waiting for something to kind of sink our teeth into, something that is not – a breaking news event that we can actually kind of work with a little bit. Mm -hmm. There's some new digital journalism techniques that we want to sort of experiment with. And so again, a lot of serendipity that that got passed on to the right person who then saw opportunity there to, to create a bigger digital story here. And 
that's where that all happened. And when it came to writing it, then I had it already all done chrono- chronologically. That's mm-hmm. why I say in some ways it was easier because that story is really written chronologically. Yeah. Ex- except for the lead, which is the avalanche. Cause I realized I couldn't go 10,000 words before <laughs> an avalanche happens. <laughs> um, so the lead basically gets pulled out of the middle of the story, plopped at the top, and then it backs up and starts at the beginning again. So if you want to take my Pulitzer away from me, go ahead. <laughs> it, was, it was simpler than maybe it looked. The reporting was harder, but the, the writing of, of it was not entirely um, as difficult as other ones I've done. So how does that compare another story that I remember watching you report in real time and then I enjoyed reading it again was the Dawnwall story. Mm. And when you're, how does it compare or how do you like the difference of going kind of going back in time, you know, trying to push, put together a bunch of different ideas versus observing something in real time and, you know, almost like at the game or in Yosemite Valley, watching this thing unfold, which one of those, I mean, do you prefer one over the other? Is one harder than the other? How does that? That's a great question. There are two different kinds of muscles. You're right. The Don Wall was much more like covering a game, like yeah. covering a Broncos game. And I knew by the end of the day or by the end of the game or an hour later, I had to file a story. Mm-hmm. You know, here's what happened today. And so that one was more like my old kind of journalism in some ways. Yeah. And frankly, when I go back and read it now in this collection, I don't love it. Really? Why words. not? Because, well, because most of them were kind of written on, on deadline. Sure. And, um, you know, I, I kind of go, this could have been written so much better. <laughs> some things I write on deadline, I go back and I really love. And I think, wow, that was really good, including some pieces in this book. But the Don Wall stories, I don't know if they're the best written stories, but they were written sort of in a hurry and certainly in kind of weird circumstances. You know, the, the game story, once they reached the top, was literally written from the top of El Cap. And I had a sat phone with me. So, you know, that's one of the weird places that you file a story from. But, you know, a lot of those interviews were from wherever I could get a good cell signal in the valley, which is hard to do. You know, inside my car, yeah. trying to record an interview with Tommy Caldwell up on the side of El Cap. And I'm like, I'm over here by the lodge because I think I got a pretty good signal. How are you guys doing up there? Um, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It, it, again, and I, I talk about this, I think, a little bit in the introduction to this book. What I remember about these stories is the experience of writing them or, mm-hmm. and reporting them more than the words. I honestly cannot tell you one sentence I wrote of those Don Wall stories. Really? Now, five years later. No, it's, honestly. Uh, and that, that's true of any story I've written. But I can totally tell you where I was, what Starbucks I was in when I filed X story or what car I was in when I was talking to so-and-so. Or I remember during... Um, Snowfall. I was in a Starbucks in Seattle when they tow- started to tow my car out front. I was on the phone with somebody, and the Starbucks barista was like, "Excuse me, is that your car they're towing?" I'm like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, I remember that, but I couldn't. I couldn't tell you two sentences in Snowfall. So it's, you know, it's it's been interesting to kind of go back and read things like the Dawn Wall and Snowfall and other stories because I really have no reason to go back and read them and, and either be surprised and happy that oh, those are actually pretty pretty well written. Mm-hmm. Or sometimes a little disappointed that, oh, man, I wish I would have done that differently. And so another thing, speaking of the intro, you talk about how you you still get nervous when you submit a, you know, mm-hmm. an article or a, a finished piece of work. And you also talk a bit about the editing process and how you, know, you read a lot that people say you need to edit and edit and edit, but you found that that doesn't necessarily work for you. So maybe talk, can you talk a little bit about editing and then make us all feel better that you still get nervous about submitting these things? <laughs> yeah. Um, I hate filing stories. Do you, you really know, you like, have you always, um, yeah, probably. <laughs> I, I, I don't like the editing process. I'm not a very good self editor. And so I will write a draft and then if I have time, I'll like, well, I'll go to bed and I'll wake up in the morning and read it. And sometimes I'll say, oh, yeah, I should do this a little bit differently, this mm-hmm. and this. But I rarely will just blow something up. I just don't have the creativity or the imagination to sort of see it differently than it's already there in front of me. And so I'm not a very good self-editor. And my editors will say that I write long. And when I file, sometimes an editor will, you know, will slack me or text me and be like, hey, do you want to talk about some of the edits that I – some ideas I have for the story? And I usually say, no, no, I don't actually, <laughs> once it's, once it's out of my fingers, once it's 
out of my laptop and filed, I don't really honestly want to see it again. I just don't want to deal with it. Uh, there's a weird anxiety to it. There's a weird sense of defeat when I file um, <laughs> because you just feel like, well, that's the best I can do. You feel like somebody on a game show that's like grabbing dollar bills or something and yeah. the clock goes off and you're like, well, this is what I got. And you just walk out and hope that it adds up to something. Uh, that's the way I feel. I, I, I would love to tell you like, I file something and it's a like big triumphant feeling and it's just not for me. It's just like, I'm, I'm kind of scared to hear what anybody has to say about it. I don't go back and read stories. I don't even look at them in the paper when they're there in there the next day. I feel like I'm going to find a mistake. I just like, okay, they're done. Move on to the next story. And part of that I think too is, is daily journalism where you don't have a whole lot of time for reflection. Mm -hmm. Literally you're writing a story and the next day you're like, what are you writing today? Mm -hmm. And you don't think about the previous day's story. And so it's like, it's done. I'll, what do I think about yesterday's story is that it's done. I don't want to hear from it again. I don't want to see it again. And uh, let's move on to the next story. So this has been a weird exercise going back and trying to find 20 stories that I really don't remember yeah. senses very well. Yeah. And um, having to reread my stories and, and sort of play editor and be like, well, there's no, I can't change them. You know, that'd be unfair to put them in an anthology and be like, oh, let's rewrite this. Story. <laughs> uh, so I hope they kind of hold up, but. Yeah, I, I realize I sound neurotic. I don't think I'm that different than a lot of reporters. Well, so kind of I'm not a reporter, that. but you're, I mean, it sounds like you're inside my brain. I mean, I had to hire somebody to help me edit this podcast because I can't stand listening to it. I mean, like, I, mm -hmm. I listen to you, but my own voice is like, and, and once it's out, I don't want to know anything about it. I've never, I've done some live things, video, like on stage where they've been recorded. I've never once watched one. I, I mean, it's the similar thing, right? Yeah. I mean, and it's not. There's no, I mean, I, it's not like a dislike myself or something. It's just kind of like, all right, that's done. There's nothing I can do about it. Like, go, go, right. go, next thing. <laughs> so, yeah, once it's published, there's nothing I can do about it. That's true. And I don't want to dismiss the editors because I realize it sounds like I don't even want to talk to editors. I've had the best editors in the world work at the, work at the New York Times, and they have saved me from myself many times. They have made my stories vastly better in a million different ways. But as far as I'm concerned, I'd like to write it and just move on to the next thing. There's a um, a book I read a long time ago by Jay Billis, the the bat, the former Duke basketball player and commentator. And it's one of these kind of self-help type books, which I, I read a lot. I used to read a ton of them, but the, the thing that stuck out from that book that I still think about almost daily is he, he talks about when you're done with something or you make a mistake or anything, he would always say next play, next play, next play. Like, and, and cause that's what he would do in basketball and that's what he does in mm -hmm. life and business. And I think whether it's a mistake or, uh, something I'm proud of or whatever. It's just kind of like, all right, that was good. Next play. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that it seems to help. Well, yeah, and I've, it's interesting because I'm a, you can see I'm wearing my John Prine t-shirt today. Oh, nice. Nice. So yeah, I'm into music a little bit just as a listener. And you think about like a songwriter, they write a song and if they do it really well, they can then perform that song over and over and over again for the rest of their careers. Mm -hmm. Whereas a writer if they do it well, they never have to look at it ever again. Like we, we just don't. And so it's weird to go back and be like, do I have to go back and listen to this again? Do I have to go back and look at this again? Because that's not what I normally do. One larger question just about, about your career and your field. Uh, you know, I feel like you've been in, as you've been in the, the journalism world, it's experienced quite a transformation. I, I would mm -hmm. say mostly fueled by the internet, but it's allowed all these kind of niche publications or podcast, or, you know, you can kind of drill down whatever your, your weird int interest is. You can find a community of people on the internet that's interested in the same thing. And, you know, that's in a way, that's what my podcast is, but can you talk a little bit about the need for real journalism um, versus the, the kind of thing I'm doing or kind of one-off type, you know, very niche, uh, slanted one way or the other. Can you talk about yeah. the importance now more than ever of, of journalism? Right. And this is obviously skewed because I work for a, a mainstream paper, right? Sure. But yeah, I do worry in a large sense about the silos that we're all living in, mm -hmm. the little bubbles that we're all living in. And we certainly see it politically, but I think you can say we see it, you know, in the media landscape too. If all we care about is bowling, and so we're just going to follow nothing but bowling. And if all I care about is football, um, that's a bubble. Sure. If all my media is focused toward that and it could be whatever niche that you're in. And I just worry that people aren't getting sort of a full spectrum of news, a full spectrum of sports, a full spectrum of perspective. 
And so I do think there's a place for mainstream media if we can keep that audience engaged to open their world. Like I would love if everybody in America watched some sort of national news or, had, mm-hmm. you know, something broader that we all connected to the same news events. Yeah. But right now it seems like we all connect to news events that only mean something to us in mm-hmm. our, in our small community of people. So how do we keep those interests broad where we have some sort of collective um, interests? Uh, and, you know, I, I'd like to argue that places like the New York times is one place that, you know, um, we can all kind of come together to to appreciate facts and truth and and come to an agreement about this is the news that happened on this event. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you want to trust the New York Times as a source, great. I think you should. Um, but I think we need these, you know, trusted news sources. And so, yeah, I think there's a place for mainstream. And I hope we don't keep getting, you know, narrower and narrower in our interests. Where do you get your news information i mean obviously you're you're on the inside of of a lot of it but how do you kind of manage the the inflow of info coming your way so that you can get substance without being completely overwhelmed or distracted from your from your work cuz your job is to be taking in all this info and and sorting through it so i mean how yeah. do you do that without driving yourself nuts it's overwhelming, right? And I, I think that's an issue for everybody. And so I do the usual news sources. Um, I'm still a fan of like local TV news. Yeah. I'm still, you know, New York Times. And I'll, I use Twitter a lot as kind of a filter. You know, of course, you have to be careful of like who you're following. But I try to follow a very broad range of perspectives. Mm-hmm. So at least I'm seeing what stories are being, being written or what things are being broadcast across spectrums. The world I live in now in, as, as a reporter is really a world of let's try to find some stories on the edges of sports a little bit. Mm-hmm. And so I'm trying to stay attuned to everything from the climbing world, the skateboarding world, which I'm now writing about because it's going to be part of the Olympics, um, the surfing world, which I've written about a little bit and again would be part of the Olympics. But also I have um, some deep rooted interests in things like climate change mm-hmm. and the environment and especially interests here in the West with things like land use. And so I try to follow people like High Country News. Anybody who kind of lives in that world that I can at least skim through to get a sense of what's going on in that world. You asked a question earlier about trying to find the stories. You know, the question for me is if I'm going to write, say, a climbing story, I know that at the New York Times, I'm, we're probably going to write four climbing stories a year. Yeah. There's no quota, but there'll be some some pretty small number of climbing stories. And you can say the same thing about anything, any sort of um, subject. Dog we're grooming. Write X number. Dog grooming. Dog grooming. <laughs> we're going to write. I mean, I know I'm going to get one dog grooming story in my career. <laughs> and so I wrote it. I but, loved it. You know, thanks. But if I have four climbing stories, I want to make sure these are the four best climbing stories. Mm-hmm. I don't want climbers who know the world better than I do to read a story going, Really? This is what you wrote about. This is the, what you chose to do. You, you know, you don't get a lot of chances at this branch. Yep. You chose this. And so I want to be credible. I want people in the world to be like, that was a smart story. That's a smart take. And he did it well. And he did it fairly. And he did it accurately. So I have to sort of filter through a lot of pitches, a lot of sort of noise and kind of go. And and, and I lean on people who I know know these worlds. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got like connections in a lot of these different niches. And say, is this the story or am I just not seeing this right? And have yeah. somebody go, yeah, this is what we're all talking about. And I'll say, great, I'm on it. When you're, you know, obviously you'll write a story wherever you need to write one, top of El Cap, your car, Starbucks. But is there an ideal time of day or kind of setup that you prefer for writing or did years you know, of deadlines and having to grind these things out, knock any of that out of you? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, that's a great question. I move around. I work off my laptop. Uh-huh. And you're catching me in what counts as the office slash cat litter room. Nice. <laughs> um, but I, I will move around the house and I like to work outside. I think years of working in press boxes and coffee shops mm-hmm. uh, makes me like and appreciate noise around me. And you could, you know, there could be a fire in front of me and I'll just like kind of look up and be like, oh. And, and keep typing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my wife says she'll walk into the room and say something to me like, Hey, uh, dinner's ready. And I'll sort of look up from, at her and give her this really weird death stare. And then like put my head back down and keep typing. She's like, Oh my God, he's in that weird zone. <laughs> but uh, I can tune out a lot around me. And I, I, I don't like being in a cubicle. I don't like being someplace quiet and blank. Uh-huh. I love to have like a view in front of me just so I can stare blankly at the view. So I'm, I think I'm pretty easy. I can work anywhere. I've worked, I've, I've written stories on 
like all all reporters on airport floors and train stations and back of cabs and that kind of thing. Nice. And who do you admire either in the journalism world or in the book writing world? I mean, who are, who are some of your heroes, mentors, people that whether you know them or not, they've impacted your, the way you do your job. So at the times, I'm going to give you an example at the times, uh, Dan Barry works at the New York times and he, um, is the best pure writer I think at the times. And what I was interviewing at the times, and I was actually, um, my friend Lynn Zinzer was, was there. It was during hurricane Katrina and they sent Dan down to, to, um, write stories from new Orleans. Mm -hmm. And that's when I first came across him. I'm like, who is this guy? He writes sentences in ways I can never write sentences. And he has now done some sports work for us, written several books. And I have like a total journalism crush on him. And he knows that he's very kind to me and puts up with me because he does things the way I wish I could do them. And I have total respect for anybody who can write sentences that I cannot imagine writing. Mm -hmm. Um, I just love different styles. So Dan Barry is one and he, he writes everything just with so such humanity and such poetry that I admire him Um, more broadly. Let me think. Here, uh, I'll show you two things I'm reading right now, um, which maybe get to this point. I'm reading Barry Lopez. Oh, anthology, yeah. The late Barry Lopez. Yeah. And uh, I just picked up a Paul Thoreau. So I love like travel writing. I love sort of arm. Ch- I love being like an armchair reader. Sure. Take me to these worlds, whether it's sort of epically outdoorsy, like Barry Lopez does, um, or more Paul Thoreau, where it's just different cultures. And take me there and mm-hmm. tell me what it feels like and tastes like and smells like um i like to to think that i can be part of that genre by taking people to places that they aren't otherwise going to go and telling them what it's like to be there do you read much fiction i don't i'm trying to think what's the last i don't read a lot of fiction me neither Um, no i've got all these book recommendation emails i send out and people there's like definitely a group of people that are very disappointed in my lack of fiction but i I try I try. I just yeah. can't. I can't get. I mean, I don't know what the problem is. You know, the uh, it's interesting. When I wrote The Last Cowboys, I went through a phase of I'm going to read all sorts of Western literature. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I was reading a lot of I had the Larry McMurtry trilogy. Oh, yeah. Um, but I was also reading like old Louis L'Amour stories yeah. and yeah. anything I could. And I was watching old Western movies, old spaghetti Westerns and stuff just to kind of get my head around sort of the pace and the language. And, Cause I wanted that book to sort of feel like part of a genre, mm-hmm. you know, a little bit stylistically and I could have some fun with it. So really the last fiction I've read was a lot of Westerns of all things. That reminds me of one other question I had about the last Cowboys. And it goes back to kind of an earlier question I'd ask, you know, you, you've written, thousands of articles. How did, how did that one stick out as there's a book here versus some of the other ones you've, you've dug into? Yeah. I think the, the snippy or snappy answer is that I just had so much fun doing it yeah. that I thought if I could, if I could figure out a way to worm my way even deeper into this family and spend more time in Utah and sure. driving in trucks around the West to rodeos, <laughs> then I'm going to do it. Um, but I, I did think there were some big themes there and that story was really narrowly told through one family. And I hope it hits on all these big themes that are now part of the West. You know, it's all water conservation and public land use and ranching generally cattle prices, national park, uh, access. Uh, I, I just, that family just has so many connections to so many of the big issues in the West that I thought there's a bigger, broader story to tell. And, as you said earlier, I really wanted to write that as more so that it felt fictionalized a little bit. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to get too deep in the weeds and land policy. Sure. I know people would would um, maybe would want more of that in this, um, but I thought there have been other books written on these things that are smarter than than mine, and I really wanted this to be a tale of a family seeing the world from their perspective out, as opposed to. I'm the guy in the helicopter above them Mm -hmm. telling you what this landscape looks like. I really wanted this to be like, here's their perspective of the world closing in on them. Well, I think, you know, selfishly, you know, being in the conservation world, the only way anybody's going to care about these issues, uh, you know, from a conservation standpoint is to care about it, you know, to, to be interested in it. And I thought that book was so great because it it gives you overviews of all these important subjects, but it, it wouldn't scare off somebody who has absolutely no, no interest in land, you know, land use or cattle prices or whatever, but it makes it interesting. And then maybe that would 
uh, kind of prompt them to go and dig a little bit deeper into something that maybe it would be boring for the, the general audience. So, I mean, it's yeah. like the equivalent of going on a hike can make you a public lands advocate eventually. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I, that's what I right. thought your, I thought yep. the last Cowboys was that version, literary version of that. So, I mean, I, I right. just, I loved it. Well, thanks. And, and I think that speaks to what my job is at the times. And, and, and again, a mainstream audience, you know, I have to, whenever I write about climbing, whenever I write about anything, it, the audience is not climbers. Mm-hmm. The audience is the grandmother on the Upper East Side mm-hmm. who has to understand what we're talking about. Yes. Here. And with the last Cowboys, it was the same thing. Like, I'm very proud that I still um, get invited to talk to book clubs, and most of them are women, mm-hmm. to about The Last Cowboys. That's an audience that's not probably going to read conservation textbooks. Exactly. Or, you know, hardcore studies of, you know, Western land use. But if we can introduce them to this world, and so in some ways it's an easier thing than what a lot of people do because I can kind of skim off the top, and I'm mm-hmm. just trying to tell very human stories that – connect to these bigger, broader issues without having to go through like the hard scientific work of diving real deep yeah. into these. It's just a different genre, but it's very much a mainstream kind of genre. It's what I do as a kind of a mainstream journalist is dive into these worlds and try to um, illuminate them in ways that are both readable and approachable and connectable and hopefully educational. So a few very quick questions before we wrap it up. You've, you've already mentioned some some good books, and I'll have links to those for people to to click through. Um, t- tell me who you like. I know. You, tell me about music taste because you've quoted a few on your Instagram. <laughs> you caught my eye with North Carolina uh, boys uh, hmm. Scott and Seth Avitt. And uh, are you kidding me? I, I mean, love those guys. I love yeah, those I'm guys. A big, I'm a big Avitt brothers fan. John Prine. I, I've said this before. I, I'd like to write stories the way that sound like John Prine lyrics, mm-hmm. just a touch of humanity with a little bit of poetry. And uh, I want people to read my sentences or at least parts of my sent of my stories and kind of go, hmm, yeah, that was, that was, that was pretty good. Yeah. I, I, I like the lyricism. So yeah, I do sort of like this Americana kind of music. I also like, I've been listening to a lot of like weird nineties um, sort of rock, like, Gin Blossoms and Smashing Pumpkins lately. And yeah. uh, I was listening to this yesterday a lot. Uh, Counting Crows, sort of a throwback to, to the 90s. And I also love like British pop punk kind of stuff. So people like the Kooks and uh, the Coral that are just kind of sort of a punk poppy kind of thing. So those nice. are probably my three genres. I'm a huge Tom Petty fan. You can, you can ask me any lyric of Tom Petty and I can probably give it to you. My buddy from high school was there, uh, was the Tom Petty tour photographer for like six or seven years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, tell me that he liked Tom Petty. Oh yeah. He, and his name was, uh, Andy Tennille and he was, uh, he just started doing, he started as a writer and then started doing photography and somehow got looped in with Tom Petty and spent like six summers on the road with Tom Petty. Wow. It. I mean, it's pretty, pretty unbelievable. That's amazing, right? Yeah. I, I hope that he came away liking Tom Petty. I, I you think know, he came away was... liking him even more than he had beginning. I mean, I think the combo, the music and, and Tom Petty himself, um, I think he was just a, a really, really, really good guy in the whole band. I mean, everything, I mean, it just seems like he's more obsessed with Tom Petty than he was before, which is <laughs> quite an endorsement. <laughs> yeah. Because there's a big thing in my business where, you know, don't get too close to your heroes because yeah. you'll see things and learn things and you'll, it'll ruin you. Exactly. So I, I think, People like to have a little bit of a distance from the people that they really admire, their favorite athletes, favorite musicians, just because it's easier than kind of knowing, oh, they're actually maybe not the person I was hoping they would be. So, exactly. Um, I'm always glad to hear that Tom Petty might be. A, yeah. A yeah. Dude. As far as I can tell. Um, and so final question. There are a lot of people, creative types that listen to this podcast. Um, if you had had to offer any advice to people, whether they want to pursue journalism, writing, whatever type of kind of creative work or purpose-driven work, you know, work they're obsessed with, like you're obsessed with your work and, and it's scratching your own itch. You're interested in these mm-hmm. stories. What, you know, given, given the success you've experienced, what would be your advice to, to people listening in? I, I guess my advice is to, to scratch that itch and figure out a way if you're, if you're really passionate about something Mm -hmm. and if you're talented at that thing, and you have to be honest with yourself, if you're talented at at it or have people around you that are honest about it, but if those two things are, are part of it, your passion and an ability, then by all means, follow it. Um, Cause you'll figure out a way for it to work out. And I feel that way about journalism and writing that, you know, you will figure out a way to make it work. And I think any creative 
anybody who's in the creative fields will figure out a way to make it work if they're passionate and they're good at it. And I just think you'll regret if you don't. I, I have a lot of friends who are kind of applying the nine to five. And I think I, I wish they would have followed that little voice in the back of their head, at least to give it a whirl, because you just never know. So follow it if you great. can. I'll, I'll, I'll take that advice. Well, John, this is awesome, man. Thank you for taking the time. I love everything you do and really great to get to know you and, uh, hope we can stay in touch. Thank you. This has been a lot of fun. I really do appreciate you and appreciate uh, being on on your podcast. This is great. Hey, it's Ed again. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast. I know your time is valuable, so it means the world that you spend it listening. If you want to support the podcast and help it to continue to spread and grow, there are a few ways you can help. Number one, pass it along to a friend or share it on social media. Word of mouth recommendations are the most powerful way for ideas to spread. So I'd love it if you could share the podcast with a few pals who might enjoy it. Number two, you can go to Apple Podcasts and give it a five-star review. Good reviews encourage the Apple overlords to suggest the podcast to others. So there's a link in the notes if you'd be so kind as to give it five stars. Number three, you can support the podcast financially via Patreon, and there are exclusive benefits for those who do, including a monthly behind-the-scenes newsletter, Mountain and Prairie stickers, live and recorded video chats with podcast guests, and much more. Number four, I've also got two emails that I send out. The first is my weekly email called Good News from the American West, which I send out every Wednesday. It's only positive news, something we can all use a little more of these days. And my other email is my bi-monthly book recommendations email. One email every other month with five, six, seven, or eight books that I've recently read and highly recommend. The thousands of people on both of these lists will vouch for me. No spam or other funny business. And number five, finally, check out my online store for Mountain and Prairie stickers, shirts, and coffee mugs. I've got some really cool designs from Western artists with more on the way. So head to mountainandprairie.com slash shop to check it all out. I'd love to connect with you. I'm on Instagram and LinkedIn, so look me up on either of those platforms by my name or through the links on my website. All right, that's it. Thanks so much for your support. Oh,